Presentation on a pain in the pelvis. It's going to be a presentation of a presacral mass, um, our uh, diagnosis and management. Um, I'd like to especially thank Dr. Maxwell and Dr. Keeter for allowing me to participate in the care of this patient. Unfortunately, neither of them could be here this morning. Um, they both had prior engagements. Um, so our patient is SS. He's a 22-year-old male who uh, first came to the service in 2014 uh, when he presented with some lower abdominal pain and nausea and had a CT revealing a dumbbell-shaped 5 by 5.4 by 4.5 centimeter pelvic mast. And at that time, it was presumed to be a uh, schwannoma. He was seen both by Dr. Maxwell and by uh, neurosurgery. Uh, neurosurgery didn't feel that it was a... Uh, neurosurgical problem at that time, so he was seen by Dr. Maxwell as well. He was offered uh, surgery then, but he had a collegiate baseball scholarship at that time, um, and with the timing that they had offered him for surgery, he would have um, missed starting school in his baseball program, and so he opted um, not to have it removed, and it was uh, deferred. So at the, and in 2014, uh, his H&P, he came in, like I said, with a, a right uh, sharp abdominal pain that had been plaguing him for approximately two days. It did radiate to the back at that time, um, and the pain had been severe enough to cause him nausea in uh, one episode of emesis. He's a fairly healthy 22-year-old. He did have uh, a TBI three years uh, prior to this presentation that resulted in um, six uh, seizure episodes, but he had not had any uh, seizures uh, in the last two years uh, when he presented to us. Uh, past surgical history is minimal. Family history did uh, include breast cancer on his mother's side and uh, lung cancer in his father. Uh, social history, uh, light alcohol, no illicit drug use or tobacco use. And his review of systems, other than uh, was noted in the HPI, was negative on 10-point <laughs> review. So like I said, pretty healthy guy. All of his labs uh, were, in, were within normal limits as well. Um, and he didn't take any medications or have any allergies. Vital signs also within normal limits. Uh, Well-nourished young man, obviously he's got a baseball scholarship, so uh, he's doing pretty well. On abdominal exam, he did have uh, right-sided tenderness to palpation, but no rebound or guarding, uh, good bowel sounds. And his neuro exam was also uh, benign with strength five out of five in uh, all four extremities and no focal uh, deficits, no gait abnormalities um, at that time. So he returned to us in 2017, having uh, finished uh, his baseball career, and came in with lower abdominal pain that he now described as an electric shock. It now radiated to bro both groins in addition to his back, and uh, is newly accompanied by lower extremity numbness and tingling. He still denied any weakness or motor deficits, still had a normal gait. Uh, vital signs, labs, still all within normal limits. On abdominal exam, he now had lower abdominal tenderness to palpation, uh, and uh, upon palpation, that would uh, radiate pain to his uh, bilateral groins and lower back. Still no rebound, no guarding. Um, and his neuro exam had changed. Uh, though he still had five out of five strength in his extremities, he now had uh, decreased sensation in the bilateral lower extremities that was greater on the right uh, than the left. So these are, um, in addition to the CTs he had, he also had an MRI in 2014 and 2017. Um, and so I just wanted to do a side-by-side -side comparison of those. So again, in 2014, the mass measured approximately five by five by five. Um, wasn't causing too much uh, nerve compression at that time. Uh, as you can see, it's not uh, invading too far into the foramen. Um, and his, you know, he was doing okay and his surgery was deferred at that time. So he came back in, in 2017. His mass is now, sorry, has now grown to six by 7.5 centimeters, um, slightly larger. Uh, but the thing that I think was causing more of his pain that you'll see in the next set of slides is that it's starting to invade more into the frame in here. And so neurosurgery uh, was again uh, consulted 
so that we could uh, collaboratively take out this mass. Um, so it was Dr. Keeter and Dr. Maxwell. Uh, they had discussed it, and um, there was discussion of retroperitoneal approach, but the tumor is so caudal it didn't think that we'd be able to reach it. And so instead we did a lower uh, midline abdominal incision that you can see in this picture. His head is at the bottom, uh, labeled there, feet towards the top of the picture. Uh, we did identify the ureter uh, and place it out of the field of dissection um, with that vessel loop across it. And then here is the mass. This is only, you can only see part of the mass. It actually extends under, um, under our retractors there off to the right a little bit more. And you'll see that better on the video. Um, we did have nerve monitoring used throughout the uh, neurosurgical uh, portion of the case. And because the mass extended um, under those retractors, uh, we did have to take it out uh, in a piecemeal fashion, which you'll see in the, in the video on the next slide. Um, and there uh, was some fascia to close um, over the sacrum at the end. We closed that with a running 3-0 vicral, and then his abdominal uh, closure was done with interrupted zero PDS and uh, stapled skin closure. Overall, he did very well uh, during the operation. Uh, no episodes of hyper hypotension. Uh, the operative time uh, for both of us uh, was a total of uh, five hours door to door, and the EBL was approximately 50 cc's. Uh, the mass, um, as you'll see in the video, was uh, quite a bit vascular, but uh, was easily controlled with electrocautery. And so this is um, uh, it's a th three minute video highlight reel of the procedure. Um, we did use the microscope during the neurosurgical dissection and Dr. Keeter was nice enough to uh, allow me to uh, participate on the microscope with him um, as you'll see towards the end of the video. But in the beginning, um, so sorry, his head is off to the right this way and this is the right side and so the mass kind of extends a little more this way um, and it was difficult to get a grasp on it and get all the way around the edge and so again the decision was made to take it out in a piecemeal fashion so this was the largest piece that we ended up taking out um, first and just kind of getting around it with electrocautery and we weren't having too much uh, issue with uh, bleeding at that time and so we cord out this area and got it passed off um, to pathology so that they could um, confirm our diagnosis. Again, we assumed that this was a schwannoma. Um, so we get it out. I personally walked it down to pathology. Um, and on the next slide, I'll show a picture of the cut specimen. What kind of a cautery instrument is that? It was just the right, uh, he, he just um, bent the cautery. Just a, it's just a yeah, long. Yeah, he just uh, okay. hockey sticked right. it a little okay. bit, sir, so that he could get around it. That part of the tumor is left there. That, so, uh, yeah. okay. Right, yeah. so this is the rest of the tumor. I wanted to show us finally getting around the edge of it and, and finding a good plane. Um, it had been a little difficult with the way that the tumor was bulging in the beginning to really get to the edge of it. And once we got that middle out, it was, um, once we cored out that section, it was a little bit easier to now, get now to around get, it. To get to this, you've reflected the colon. Yes, the colon up, sir, and the, and the uh, bowel the, was. What, to the, to the left? or the, uh, Superiorly, and then we, um, the small bowel was uh, reflected off to the left. Because you're down in the pelvis. We are right? down in the pelvis. We are all the way on the sacrum. Um, where, where the rectum right is. under this. That's so a lot of this tumor was taken by blunt dissection once we got the planes and the edges. Um, there was a little more cautery needed at this point um, just because of some of the vas uh, vessels going to the tumor. This is the moment where Dr. Keeter kindly asked if I wanted to take out the very last part of this tumor. Um, and so I used the microscope was a little bit of a new, new technology for me. Um, but he allowed me to take out that last part. It was mostly by blunt dissection. What sacral segment? I'm sorry, sir. What, what sacral segment are you at? Uh, S1, S2. And then um, we palpated to make sure that there didn't seem uh, to be any tumor left behind. 
but you could see that we had found a, a pretty good plane at the bottom of that tumor to get around. Um, and we used the electrocautery uh, to achieve hemostasis. I did just continue this part because I wanted you to be able to see, oh, sorry, um, the edges that we, we use the edges of this um, tissue here to cover the sacrum, and that's what we pulled together with the 3 of vicryl and just kind of did a running. Uh, what is this? This is the capsule so that was yeah, around this is a, the tumor. A, yes, sir. What was left of the capsule around the tumor, and the sacrum is actually right here, um, and so we just pulled that tissue over so that it wouldn't be bare. What was the reason to need to do that, I guess, is, if I'm understanding? Dr. Maxwell Adam. just felt it would be, be best if we, we okay. had that tissue there. Nothing um, wrong with it. I'm just curious. Yes, sir. About. He just felt that, you know, it was there. We might as well get some coverage on it if we had that tissue there. Um, so this is the specimen. That's the, the first uh, piece that we cored out. And then I followed it down to pathology. They'd inked it and uh, already uh, sliced it so that they could um, check our diagnosis. It was, in fact, not a schwannoma. It was a neurofibroma. Um, unfortunately, they didn't take any pictures of the slides they did, um, but I do have uh, a little slide on the pathology uh, momentarily. But I did want to talk about uh, presacral neurogenic tumors and benign nerve sheath tumors. Uh, as well as neurofibromatosis, since this turned out to be a neurofibroma and not a schwannoma in our patient. So usual uh, presacral neurogenic tumors are usually benign nerve sheath tumors. Only 2.5% uh, of them end up being malignant. Um, transformation uh, into malignancy is usually more common in plexiform neurofibroma, which is not what our patient had. He had a nodular neurofibroma. Um, these usually occur in the head and neck and extremities, and so presacral uh, nerve sheath tumors are a little uh, more rare. And they are usually diagnosed in a, a delayed presentation because the patients don't have symptoms until they have nerve compression or um, just from the, the tumor bulk. A lot of the um, papers that I came across and case reports that I came across about presacral tumors, most of those patients were coming in with their tumors upwards of 20 centimeters um, before they actually had any symptoms and, and presented. Um, surgical excision, again, is, is diagnostic and therapeutic. We thought this was a schwannoma uh, until we got it out. But complete surgical uh, excision usually provides long-term control and care. Um, Except for those with neurofibromatosis, they're more prone to having uh, repeat tumors um, or, again, um, malignant ge degeneration, uh, and that is the same with a plexiform neurofibroma as well. So this was a, um, just a nice comparison that I came across while I was doing reading between neurofibromas and schwannomas. Uh, usually schwannomas are uh, very well encapsulated. Uh, neurofibromas are not as much. Um, the nerve in neurofibromas um, can uh, be involved and distorted, but with a schwannoma, usually the nerve is eccentric to the mass and is pushed to the side, and so you can identify it uh, easily on dissection. Um, we did not see any nerves uh, when we were doing our dissection. Um, of our of our neurofibroma at that time. And then if you'll uh, recall back to our sliced specimen, uh, schwannomas uh, will have cystic degeneration. Ours didn't have any. It was a smooth uh, tan surface. And then neurofibromas uh, are associated with neurofibromatosis. And I wanted to talk about neurofibromatosis because my first thought when uh, we found out it was a neurofibroma and not a schwannoma was, does our patient need to be worked up uh, further for any uh, genetic deficit. Um, again, pathology did not um, take pictures of our slides, um, and so I did end up finding a picture, um, sorry, a paper uh, reviewing the pathology of peripheral nerve sheath tumors, and it had some nice uh, pictures. I just really wanted to highlight these two. Again, this looks a lot like our specimen, no cystic uh, degeneration, just uh, very nice smooth tan. And then uh, the pathologist said we had this nice 
wavy, wavy nuclei here and the shredded carrot collagen appearance. So I tried to find some slides that um, were similar to our specimen. So uh, we'll go a little bit into neurofibromatosis. Uh, it was first described in 1882, also known as von Recklinghausen's disease. Uh, you know, we always have the lovely pictures in our textbooks of the patients with multiple uh, cutaneous neurofibromas. Uh, the prevalence is approximately 1 in 3,000. It's an autonomal dominant defect, sorry, defect of uh, the NF1 gene located on the long arm of chromosome 17. Uh, the penetrance is 100%, uh, but the um, characteristics are uh, present variably in patients, even in the same family. Uh, they can have very uh, variable phenotype. Um, but up to 95% of cases can be diagnosed clinically by the age of 11. Um, and we'll go over the different uh, clinical characteristic, characteristics that are required for uh, diagnosis. Um, these patients can also have learning disabilities uh, seen in more than 50% of individuals, as well as behavioral problems and autistic features. And also um, read that their lifespan is 10 to 15 years shorter uh, than the average human, uh, sorry, healthy adult, um, but they did not expound upon uh, what it was that um, caused their early uh, mortality or morbidity. Um, neurofibromas, again, the cutaneous ones, they're composed of Schwann cells, fibroblasts, mast cells, and parasite, or pericytes. So this is mostly a clinical diagnosis. It can be confirmed um, by doing genetic testing, um, but you require two or more of the following features in order to diagnose neurofibromatosis. And our patient um, didn't have any of these features um, on physical exam, um, but uh, six or more cafe au lait spots measuring, um, they can be smaller in, uh, before puberty and then grow um, after puberty, so they have to be uh, at least 15 millimeters after puberty, puberty uh, to count as a cafe au lait spot uh, for neurofibromatosis. Usually uh, the number of cafe au lait spots um, will stabilize with age, uh, so they don't just keep um, getting them. Uh, two or more neurofibromas or one plexiform neurofibroma, uh, and the plexiform uh, version is more thick and irregular and involves multiple nerves. Um, and I spoke specifically to Dr. Keeter because I wanted to see if our patient was going to get any further uh, genetic workup, but he said, well, because we only had a single um, tumor, it was likely uh, not neurofibromatosis. If we were to have a second tumor, then um, they would start talking to him about uh, genetic workup. But, but again, he didn't have any cephalate lay spots or um, any of the uh, remaining features of neurofibromatosis. So we're, that is lower down uh, on our concerns for our patient. Uh, they also have freckles in the armpits or groin. Uh, optic pathway gliomas are seen, uh, lish nodules. And they also have bony changes such as sphenoid wing dysplasia, uh, which we'll see a picture of on the next slide. And they can have uh, thinning of the long bones, most often the tibia, but it can affect other long bones as well. And then, of course, uh, any first-degree relatives with neurofibromatosis type 1. So I wanted to make sure that everybody knew what these features looked like. Um, and this is in order of how they show up, um, how they appear on the patient chronolog by chronologic age. Um, so these are the cafe au lait spots, just kind of these. And they're nice, you know, smooth borders, dark um, spots. And they can show up. They'll, they can uh, show up anytime from um, birth. So that's the uh, earliest manifestation. The axillary freckling uh, will appear soon thereafter. This is the sphenoid uh, wing defect that you can see here, and that usually uh, is uh, apparent uh, early in life as well. The optic nerve gliomas usually present by age four. Um, so that's an early presentation. And then the Lish nodules uh, usually don't present until uh, pubertal years. So more often found in, uh, 
and the teenagers, and then the learning disabilities and the behavioral uh, deficits um, generally are not uh, noticed until the patient is, you know, 10, 10 years plus. So I did also find this new paper from the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology. Um, they wanted to uh, predict neurofibromatosis earlier uh, in children just using uh, cafe au lait uh, macules, since that is the earliest uh, present, uh, presentation of the disease. And so they did a retrospective study of patients with uh, isolated, this is cafe au lait macules, uh, to identify high-risk patients at an earlier age. So they looked at the age of the patient, uh, the type of macules they had, and whether or not they had atypical macules, which uh, atypical ones are going to be um, uh, ragged, ragged on the edges, odd shapes, and um, not necessarily uh, a uniform color. And so they had a total of 900, or sorry, 419 individuals uh, that were tested at the University of Alabama. Um, and the uh, mutations in the NF gene were detected in 41% of those patients. Um, and once they had looked at all those uh, affected with the NF1 gene, they had 148 of uh, 184 individuals defined as high risk um, in their algorithm that they came up with. And um, after doing um, re regression logistics and checking the area under the curve, uh, they felt that their algorithm um, uh, could detect, um, sorry, could detect uh, the high-risk patients. And so they, they showed that the low-risk patients were um, older than 29 months. If they had any atypical macules, they were less likely. Um, to have neurofibromatosis, or if they had six by that age, they were less likely. Um, so the high-risk category, they're going to be younger patients that already have six or more, uh, and they found that if they use that algorithm, um, 80 percent of those patients ended up having neurofibromatosis. So if you have uh, patients that are in that high-risk category, they suggested uh, that they start genetic testing and counseling um, earlier on. Now, these, these cafe au lait macules, is yes, this sir. what you see in the axilla and groin, or these are just anywhere on the body? Those are anywhere on the body. The axillary uh, freckling uh, in the intratriginous zones um, usually appear after the cafe au lait spots, and so they were using the cafe au lait spots because those usually present first. Um, so the post-op course for our patient, again, he's a young Pretty healthy guy, did fairly well. Um, like I said, he didn't have any of the stigmata of NF1, um, so it was likely just a sporadic neurofibroma. Dr. Keeter's going to uh, keep a close eye on him, make sure he doesn't have any um, further tumors that appear. Um, on post-op day one, he was already on a clear liquid diet and ambulatory. Um, post-op day two, he was tolerating a regular diet. He was home by post-op day three. He's been seen by Dr. Keeter in the office already, has gotten his staples out, and is doing well. Um, he was even cleared for work. His only complaint at this point is um, intermittent right thigh paresthesias. I talked to Dr. Keeter about that. He thinks it's a post-op nerve root inflammation. He said it's not, un not uncommon, uh, and he expects that to improve. So I'll be interested to see how our patient does a little further down the road. Um, but he doesn't have any gait abnormalities. Um, his sensation is better than it was uh, when he had the tumor in place. So this is my cost of medicine slide. I enjoyed using the fancy microscope, so I thought I would get the price on there. Dr. Keeter informed me that the price for that microscope could run anywhere from $350,000 to $500,000. And this is the microscope that we have, the Pentera 900, um, which is nice because you can record your stuff and save it on a thumb drive. Um, and then our patient had a nerve monitor for probably two hours, two and a half hours. Uh, and so the patient uh, charged for that equipment and for the staff uh, to read the tracings is, uh, was approximately $4,000 for him. Where was that nerve monitor attached to the patient? I mean, which nerves were you monitoring? Um, you know what, sir? I did not see where they had attached it. They already had it set up um, when I got in there. But, yeah, it's lower, the, lower yeah we were... Okay. 
These are my references. And these are my dogs. And I will attempt to answer any questions. Questions, comments? Terrific case. Yeah, Dr. Greer. What, what are the complications of uh, your Uh, malignant degeneration, um, I don't know, honestly, sir, I didn't see too much right on the either, complications. I thought there were some long-term, uh, like, videos and things like that can occur in neurofibromatosis, but I don't remember right now, but there are some long-term consequences, aren't they, of having neurofibromatosis? Well, there are, I just didn't specifically... Anybody read on the long-term complications. Like I said, the one that talked about them having a shorter lifespan, they didn't expound upon. You know, that time identifying if they have it. So I thought once you identify it, what, what should you do with those patients so far as long-term surveillance? Uh, ophthalmic exams um, to check for the optic nerve gliomas. And... With, with the optic nerve issue, do they, have vis do they have vision problems or did you read anything about that? It, I think it was more that they wanted early surveillance. I feel like the they're so concerned about it. From what I read, they were catching them pretty early um, because if they get diagnosed with the neurofibromatosis, they have the children set up with pediatric ophthalmologists doing yearly exams. They suggest that they be done yearly. I wonder what they patients. do about it. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But One thing about these tumors is interesting that you send them to the neurosurgeons and they send them back to you. Yeah, it was just the first time they sent it back. No, I had one of those. Oh, they did? It's a schwannoma that I had to peel off the spine and the vessels. And, and even though they call schwannoma, which is a neurologic cell, yeah. and neurofibroma, yes. they send it back to you. And I don't know why. From uh, what I understood, just I wasn't there the first time in 2014. But reading back in the notes, um, it seemed like because it was not invading the foramen at that time that they felt that general surgery would be a better fit for that patient. That's what I gathered from the notes, um, but I did not actually ask him that. <laughs> One of the things is uh, the waste the basket for everything. Differentiate those. Dr. Bohm's back there. What about it, Dr. Bohm? What about the <laughs> uh, Talking about schwannomas and neurofibromas any, and follow-up of them. Uh, yeah, this is a fascinating case. Uh, the the, the follow-up is generally looking for peripheral and central tumors uh, that most of the time are going to be benign, but sometimes, again, uh, may develop malignant degeneration and just probably scanning these people when, who, that, that do harbor these tumors uh, every two or three years, and occasionally they will start growing rapidly. Many times there are so many of them, you just can't remotely take them all out. And That's usually, the neurofibromatosis that you're speaking right. of. Yeah. yeah, and generally most of these tumors are schwannomas. I, I can't remember taking out a neurofibroma in my career. So yeah. the majority of these patients, and this behave more like a schwannoma to me than a neurofibroma. <coughs> but schwannomas, if, if you make the diagnosis, like, the thing that I was curious about is you had this huge pelvic mass in 2014, and 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 made a presumptive diagnosis. I mean, there's no bi no biopsy or anything. I mean, maybe the pa maybe he just maybe he turned down any treatment. I assume somebody he offered did, to he take wanted it out. to. Uh, yeah, he go wanted play to play baseball. baseball. But I mean, I guess can you make that diagnosis just on MRI, Peter, uh, like they did in 2014? Take a picture of that and say that's likely a schwannoma down Correct. in the pelvis like that. You can't. Correct. Yeah. And it was asymptomatic. Uh, I would certainly. I have no problems watching that until it becomes symptomatic as it did in this case. Because uh, many times they don't become symptomatic. They just sit there and don't grow. They just, you know, don't change at all. But obviously this did and required then operative intervention. Yeah. Well, it's a, certainly an unusual case to me. I mean, I still, I know you, you, you did reflect the parent name and pull the rectum out of the way to get to this thing. That, uh, you're already there, right? Okay. We pulled it to the left because the tumor was more so right far side. to the right. And we didn't realize, you could see on the scan that it was more to the right, but it seemed like once we got out in there and moved everything away, it wanted to lean even more to the right, which is why we couldn't take it out all in, in one piece. 
Okay. Well, thank you for that case. Let's go on and move to the next one. While we're getting ready for that, I want to uh, introduce, to, uh, remind everyone we have a new faculty member, Dr. Robert Jean. Raise your hand, Robert, in case nobody, in case some of the residents may not have met you, some more junior residents. I think everybody now knows who he is, but he was here, finished a couple of years ago, been in practice for a while, and we were able to get him to come back and join us. So you're going to be seeing a lot of Dr. Jean uh, in, the f in the future. We're really glad to have him back. Good morning. Uh, I have an interesting case of a wandering spleen. Um, Dr. Lisa Smith, uh, this was her case. She is going to try to make it um, this morning if she's able to. Um, so this is an outline of the case. I'll start with, or of the presentation, I'll start with a case presentation. I'll give you a little bit of the embryological development uh, of this situation. Um, review some of the literature specifically focusing on treatment options um, and then look at uh, some of the post splenectomy care um, and the cost of medicine. <coughs> Case presentation. Uh, we had a nine-year-old female who came in over the summer. She had had about a three-day history of, quote, vomiting and the stomach bug. She also had some persistent left upper quadrant pain and generally appeared uncomfortable and lethargic. Her parents originally um, said she had somewhat frequent episodes of stomach bug, and they only became concerned because her general, her <coughs> usual course uh, was to have the stomach bug, then spend about 24 hours recovering and be sort of lethargic, and then she would bounce back and be herself. And as the third day drew to a close and she continued to be lethargic and unwell, they became concerned and brought her to the emergency department. She had those more mild stomach episodes, but then she had also had one previous episode about a year earlier when they had been on vacation where she had the same sort of left upper quadrant pain, um, and they took her to the emergency department. She was diagnosed with spilomegaly, um, but that episode also completely resolved. About three months before that episode, um, she had also had mono, um, and uh, her only other medical history was ADHD. She'd had no surgeries. Uh, her family history is unknown because she was adopted, and her only medication is uh, Adderall. On exam, she had a temperature of 100, um, but otherwise her vitals were within normal limits. Um, again, she appeared uncomfortable and sort of was squirming on the bed, but lethargic. She was sort of curled up in a fetal-like position. Uh, her exam was uh, primarily anomalous in her, abdo her abdominal exam. She had this very large palpable left upper quadrant and left sided mass, which was very tender to palpation. Her labs had a leukocytosis, 13 and a half, and her platelets were low, presumably now we can assume due to uh, splenic sequestration. Otherwise, her uh, labs were normal. Um, she had an ultrasound, which showed splenomegaly, and then obtained a CT. I'll give you the CT results here, and then I'll have some imaging coming up. Um, her CT showed a markedly enlarged uh, spleen, approximately 16 centimeters in craniocaudal length. Um, it was hypodense, and um, the hilum didn't have any uh, enhancement, or had abnormal enhancement, um, and had a swirling appearance. The radiologist also noted some perisplenic fluid. So Dr. Smith and I went down and reviewed the imaging with the radiologist and specifically focused on a few things. You can see here the gross enlargement of the spleen, and I'll just highlight it um, coming down here. Sorry, I'm having trouble seeing it myself. Um, and then uh, it's, it's much darker. Also, you can see in this uh, hilum, circled in green, um, there's sort of a swirl appearance to it. And the portion that's closer to the spleen, you can see there's no longer any enhancement. Um, and then we specifically spoke with the radiologist. We were curious, trying to figure out if there might be any collateral blood flow supplying the spleen despite the torsion, which might en uh, enhance its the possibility that it was still viable. So here I've shown a schematic um, of some of the collateral blood flow that goes to the spleen. And you can see on A, those are the collaterals coming from the short gastrics, and that's specifically what we were looking for. You can see specifically in this imaging that there's both the artery and the vein flow together, and that becomes important in the, um, the comparison slide I'll show next. 
Um, and then also the left gastroepiploic is B, and of course the splenic artery. This is uh, some imaging which shows gastric varices, which of course are venous, um, but I was just trying to highlight where you might look for gastric uh, collaterals so that you could see that our patient doesn't have any. So the white arrow shows those um, collaterals, shows the varices, um, which would be with the collaterals, uh, to the short gastrics. The yellow arrows are um, some submucosal varices and then um, some <coughs> left renal uh, flow as well. But you can see on our patient's imaging right here, there's absolutely no uh, collateral blood flow. So we decided to take the patient immediately to the operating room. We consented her for exploratory laparotomy with central venous line, uh, possible splenectomy, and sp possible splenoplexy. Because the spleen was so grossly enlarged, we decided to proceed in an open fashion rather than attempt laparoscopic. Uh, we made our midline incision, and um, we immediately were able to appreciate a grossly infarcted spleen, um, which was easily presented through the incision. Uh, it was grossly enlarged. It had a 360 degree rotation, a torsion, uh, so we started by placing a vessel loop around the splenic pedicle, um, and then, which you can see here, uh, the white vessel loop with the red rubber to put some, um, to tighten it down. Um, and then we untorched the spleen and explored the hilar vessels. Uh, they were thrombosed, um, so the splenic artery and the splenic vein were both suture ligated. Uh, since they were both thrombosed and the spleen was um, clearly not viable, we proceeded to um, do a splenectomy. Uh, after we got the spleen out of the field, we evaluated the diaphragm, and uh, there were no defects, and we evaluated the stomach, which was intact and not involved. There was some um, torsion of, as well of the tip of the pancreas, um, which was involved. Here's the picture of the spleen um, after it was removed from the field. And the pathology findings came back with hemorrhagic and congestive splenic parenchyma, uh, 15 by 12 by four, five and a half centimeters. And you can appreciate just how enlarged it was given the mass, which was 618 grams as compared to a more typical mass of about 150 to 200 grams. You can also appreciate on this slide that there are no uh, suspensory ligaments on this spleen. So the, the, the spleen was not, uh, you got no retroperitoneal attachment. That's correct. Posteriorly. Okay, it was, it was completely mobile. Then. Completely mobile. Okay. <laughs> so a little bit about the history of a wandering spleen. This was first uh, reported in 1667 on autopsy by Dr. Van Horn. And about 200 years later was the first time it was operatively um, treated by a splenectomy by Dr. Martin in 1877. About 20 years later was the first time it was treated with spleno splenopexy and left in place by Dr. Ludwig Reidiger. Um, in terms of epidemiology, there's a strong female preponderance of uh, wandering spleen with about 20 to, uh, with an average age of about 20 to 40. Um, as I reviewed the literature, I was amused to find about half of the reports document that this is predominantly uh, present in children, and about the other half said this is predominantly present in adults. So there's clearly some debate. Um, it's a pretty rare uh, finding, and it's similarly a rare indication for splenectomy, representing about 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 uh, cases of splenectomy are performed for wandering spleen. Um, in addition to the full spleen being able to uh, be mobile um, and torse, there's also cases of just accessory spleens causing torsion with similar symptoms. Accessory spleens are very common. They, represent, they are present in about 10 to 30 percent of population. They're typically asymptomatic, um, but they can torse. Um, and that typically happens only if they're greater than six centimeters in size. In terms of the embryology, um, the spleen is developed from uh, mesenchymal cells, um, which form here in the dorsal mesogastrium. 
If these fail to fuse completely, that's where these accessory spleens come from. Um, and then as uh, development continues, that it begins to form in about the fifth week of gestation. As development continues and the stomach rotates with the greater curvature moving towards the left, the spleen is pushed up towards the left upper quadrant. Um, and then uh, it's not well understood exactly what happens that causes uh, a wandering spleen, um, but they suspect that it's just a genesis of these suspensory ligaments or idiopathic malformation, um, and then also a failure of fusion of that dorsal mesogastrium to the peritoneum that covers the left kidney, resulting in a failure of those suspensory ligaments. Uh, not surprisingly, um, as you think about a failure of suspensory ligaments, the congenital defects that are often associated with these frequently have to do with um, a failure of uh, the uh, anatomy to provide a location for attachment. For example, um, prune belly syndrome where there is lack of musculature of the abdominal wall so that the abdominal wall and diaphragm are not easily accessible or congenital diaphragmatic hernia where the diaphragm is missing in a particular location, and so again, you, there's no place for the suspensory ligament to attach. In addition to the congenital defect associations, there are also acquired etiologies, and I think this is truly where um, the uh, predominance of female cases comes from, because a lot of these have to do with pregnancy, with multiparity, hormonal effects of pregnancy, as well as more uh, gender neutral causes like connective tissue diseases. Um, uh, and then, of course, uh, these wandering spleens are always associated with a long vascular pedicle, which provides opportunity and space for the spleen to torse. So symptoms of wandering spleen. Again, these occur most frequently in um, uh, non-attached spleens or accessory spleens greater than six centimeters in size. Patients often have vomiting, fever, um, intestinal obstruction, and pancreatitis. On our uh, patient, um, she actually had very uh, enlarged, she had a lot of stool and gas in her um, colon uh, and appeared to have, one of the reads was a potential small bowel obstruction. So she also was having some of these obstructive type symptoms. Uh, as Tors splenic torsion develops, you have venous return cut off first, disrupted first, and then you can have hemorrhagic infarction of the parenchyma. If this happens acutely, it can have very severe sequela, including rupture of the spleen with hemorrhagic shock. Um, and as I suspect our patient have had, um, you can have intermittent torsion, which causes these intermittent and recurrent episodes. And I suspect that's exactly what happened a year prior and perhaps some of her other more mild um, stomach episodes as well. Um, and the treatment for splenic torsion is obviously splenectomy or splenopexy. So as we prepared to um, go into our case, we were debating what our uh, intended operation would be. Um, so uh, splenectomy, as I've reviewed the literature, is really only indicated if you have no evidence of splenic blood flow at, um, after detorsion uh, or when the spleen is infarcted, um, in danger of rupture, and with splenic vein thromboses. Um, and splenopexy to preserve the spleen is the preferred treatment if possible. Um, and then as we so frequently see, laparoscopic treatment is preferred if you're able to do that uh, because it's easier on the patients in terms of recovery. Um, I did find one case that I was surprised to discover of non-operative management of uh, splenic torsion. This was a unique case. Um, it was a 41-month-old child who had a history of giant omphalocele, and so she clearly would not have a friendly abdomen for surgical intervention, and she presented very late. Um, she'd had three days of fever, intense abdominal pain, uh, and her CT showed total infarction and it had the hilum of the spleen actually facing laterally with no enhancement of the hilum. So they felt that um, 
she was, they hoped that she was out of the danger zone, so they hospitalized her for close observation and pain control for five days, and then she was discharged. Uh, she did well after that, and um, they noted uh, contraction of the spleen several months later on follow-up. So the, the residual of the spleen just became atrophic and shrunk. Yes, sir. Um, so there are a lot of different described techniques for how to do a splenopexy, which I, I thought was interesting. Um, there's descriptions of it taking the uh, vascular pedicle and actu actually attaching it to the anterior abdominal wall or diaphragm uh, to prevent torsion, further torsion. Um, there are descriptions of taking the omentum and using that to form a tissue pouch to fix the spleen. Um, using the different ligaments, the colophrenic, the gastrocolic ligaments, um, to uh, create pouches to hold the spleen. Um, there's a description of elevating the peritoneum off the underlying muscles and diaphragm and using that to create a pouch. And then, um, as you can see here, there are mesh fi fixation techniques. And again, these can be performed either laparoscopically or open. So our case, um, uh, our patient did well postoperatively. She returned to the floor after her surgery, um, and the same day she began tolerating a clear liquid diet. Um, on post-op day one, her pain was controlled. Um, her platelets were recovering up to 154 from 52, and she had a lipase that day, which uh, was 13, uh, indicating no pancreatitis. Um, later in that day, she was interested and participated in a regular diet, um, and she was discharged home that evening with, uh, after having received two of her indicated vaccines. Um, she was also given penicillin prophylaxis uh, daily at discharge, um, and then she followed up with her pediatrician about six weeks later, who will continue to follow her for vaccines and boosters. Um, and received her other two vaccines. I wanted to spend a little bit of time on post-op, post-splenectomy complications. There is an increased risk of infection for these patients in the 90 days, uh, specifically, especially in the first 90 days following um, this surgery. Um, uh, about 10.2 percent of these patients get an infection during those first 90 days. Uh, they compared these patients to this paper I reviewed compared these patients to appendectomy patients and the general population. I've only given you the results for the appendectomy patients. Um, appendectomy patients in the first 90 days following surgery have about a 4.2 percent chance of infection. There's also an increased risk of uh, venous thromboembolism um, with a 1.9 percent risk as it compared to 0.3 percent for appendectomy. And then, of course, as we all know, you have uh, the long-term risk of overwhelming post-splenectomy infection. Um, there's, about a life, there's a lifetime risk of about 1 to 3 percent of OPSI, um, but it's a very dramatic uh, infection if it happens, and it has a mortality of about 0 0.73 per thousand patient years. So in order to mitigate the risk of OPSI, um, there are a number of steps we can take. Children receive daily penicillin prophylaxis. Um, if they're under, they receive this either until they're the five years of age or for a full year following uh, splenectomy in order to reduce the rate of pneumococcal bacteremia. Adults, however, um, may receive the penicillin prophylaxis but do not routinely do so. Um, and patients are asked to maintain a current prescription for um, antibiotics to have on hand, uh, for example, Augmentin, and if they develop a fever, they should immediately begin their antibiotics and then present immediately for further medical care and workup. Um, and then, as I mentioned previously, uh, the vaccines. Um, if patients are scheduled for an elective splenectomy, they're asked to complete these vaccines at least 14 days prior to surgery. Um, but uh, as we know from our trauma patients, we frequently um, will do these immediately post-op. Um, its literature suggests that a good time would be several weeks after surgery, but uh, you can do it 
at any time. The hematologist involved in our patient's case um, was the one who chose to administer the vaccines the day following surgery. Um, and these vaccines need to include both the PCV13 as well as the PPSV23 at different times, um, as well as H influenza, meningococcal, and uh, annual influenza vaccines. The influenza vaccine should be the inactivated formula. Um, in terms of cost of medicine, one of the notable things that I thought about this case, I failed to mention earlier, as we closed our surgical incision, we did intraoperative tap blocks on this child uh, using Expirel. We frequently uh, consult anesthesia to do these percutaneous tap blocks, um, but you can also do them intraoperatively and do, uh, through direct visualization, the tap blocks injecting the Expirel into the layer between the transversus abdominis muscle and uh, internal uh, oblique um, to achieve a similar effect. Um, and I think that this was in large part uh, the contributing factor to um, the impressive pain control we were able to achieve on this child with very large x lap incision and allow her to go home the day following surgery. Uh, so Expirel is not cheap. It costs about $718 for a 40 ml bottle. Um, but I wanted to compare this to the average cost of an inpatient hospital day um, in Tennessee, uh, which is about $1880. Uh, again, special thanks to Dr. Smith. Um, these are my references, which you cannot really read. Apologies. Um, and thank you for your attention. The, the tap block now, was this done prior to closing and done from the intraperitoneal side, or do you do it percutaneously? No, sir. We did it prior to closing, and we um, injected it going all the way up along the incision, approximately every three millimeters uh, direct injection. Just an incision then? I mean, is it just a... It, is it truly a nerve block or is it just a perfusion of, of the Expirel into the tissues? Uh, that's a good question. Okay. I, we call it a nerve block. Well, I mean, she people always call, refers people to People call it. an inguinal block a, yes, a block, you know, when you're doing a hernia, and I don't really think it's a block as much as it is. Just you anesthetize the whole area. Uh, but, but So that's I why I was that, asking. I thought yes, maybe sir. there was some specific anatomic location we do aim, that you use. Um, we, uh, in fact, try to aim yeah, for good. that layer. Yeah, that's what. Okay. Um, here, last where the now. intercostal muscle runs around between those two um, muscle layers. So we intentionally we aim for that layer, um, and then you can see. Sorry, these aren't as big as I had hoped. Uh, the intercostal is kind of the lighter tan coming around, and then it turns into the um, the anterior. Uh, cutaneous layer perforates and goes back up. So I think we're aiming to, for the intercostal here so that it comes around and uh, also um, numbs the area innervated by the anterior cutaneous. Whereas out here, um, they're aiming, they go down, you can watch them go through the different muscle layers and try to uh, block this nerve here. What's interesting about that Expirel is that it's a lysis liposomal suspension of um, bupivacaine. And so because it's got that liposome, it doesn't, uh, Dr. Smith and I have talked about this on a number of occasions, those fatty globules don't move very much. And so to be really maximally effective, uh, you have to inject very close distances, and so she always talks about aiming for three millimeters spacing. Okay, well, that, that's something I didn't know. Yeah, Dr. Greer? Uh, would you consider doing a PEXI on this patient? She had thrombocytopenia secondary to the enlarged spleen, so would you attempt to salvage the spleen if it's already causing the thrombocytopenia? Well, we. I mean, I, I wouldn't have attempted to, after we opened her up, there was total thrombosis of all the vessels. Oh, had, had the spleen looked normal. Had it looked normal. And, and she had the thrombocytopenia, would that be an indication to remove the spleen is what I'm questioning. That, that's a valid question because if you go on and look for 
the overwhelming splenic sepsis. I mean, there is some controversy about what was the reason you took out the spleen in terms of whether or not it really puts you at increased risk for opsy. Uh, because there's fairly strong feeling among some people that removing the spleen for trauma doesn't really put you at risk. But removing spleen for thrombocytopenia or something like you're describing here, for whatever reason, a diseased spleen or some, some, some problem that led to a need for splenectomy as a result of their problem, those are patients that are really at maximum risk for opsy. And the ones you really need to concentrate on now. You know, that, that's, that's debated. Uh, Dr. Richardson uh, gave the uh, scooter oration at the college about that, and it created quite a stir, but there's a, there's a paper about that if you ever really want to read it. And it there really is not a real, there's not a lot of good evidence that post-traumatic splenectomy leads to much problem with that. Now, not that you shouldn't give them vaccine, but there's not very many of those patients that have, that have had a problem. It's the ones that have had thrombocytopenia and have yeah, that. Robert? Uh, did you read anything about uh, recurrence after splenopexy? And the reason I ask is actually one of the first interesting cases that I did as an intern here was on a wandering spleen. And it seems to me that these people have some sort of connective tissue disorder. Right. Uh, the patient that we actually had 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 Hirschsprungs and had the multi-step procedure for Hirschsprungs, and I think she was in her early 20s, and she didn't have a single adhesion anywhere in her body. Um, and I just wonder, you know, we wound up doing a splenopexy because she was still relatively young, and, you know, we did sort of the mesh wrap and su sutured it to the diaphragm and to the lateral abdominal wall. But I was just wondering if, you know, as any literature come out recently about like the recurrence of, of this after doing a splenopexy? I didn't see any such literature, but I will admit, even on that case that talked about taking the vascular pedicle and suturing that up, I mean, you're, I see you're essentially hoping that it pins it in place and there's not space for torsion, but I wondered about that myself. I appreciate the slide that's showing the splenopexy because I was sitting here thinking, how are you going to pex the spleen? Right, and there are early papers. Uh, I mean, suturing the spleen, and you know, we can suture the spleen and stop it from bleeding, and that, as, as I hope everybody knows, I mean, that's one of the things that's talked a lot about in trauma surgery where you do a hemisplenectomy and stop bleeding and wrap it up and whatever. So uh, the, the, the slide was impressive because it, at least it showed one way of doing it, but it, uh, to try to think that you're good, like Robert says, throw the splenic capsule up, is it really going to hold uh, as somebody gets bigger? Uh, I don't know. Other questions? What about, is, is, this, is this a rare enough entity that, that this is a reportable case or it's frequent enough that, that it wouldn't be? I had hoped that it would be a reportable case and I had intended to write it up as a case report and as I began my literature review, there have been seven case reports in the last two years, so I kind of thought yeah. maybe not. May not be, yeah. Well, it's still an interesting case, so very, very much so. Other questions or comments? All right. Well, we look forward to everybody next week. We have uh, interview day next Wednesday. Good job, both of you.